before. <laughs> There's nothing else left to open. So again, apologies for that, but we will be back to our, our normal running in the Larmor Theatre pretty soon. Okay, well listen, it's good to get back to face-to-face -to -face meetings. Um, I hope uh, I see quite a few of our regulars, it's great. And I hope we can continue with this without any more interruptions. Um, we've got a busy night. Um, first one is welcome again. And did everybody get their new sheet? Yeah. Eve and, and Mary on their, If anybody hasn't got us, let us know and we'll make sure you get sorted out. I thought it might be interesting to start with some, some of our highlights. Um, very quickly run through a few. Uh, we had three super moons through the summer there. Um, will I do the presentation? Yeah. Alan said the lights weren't working up yeah, here. So they're, 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 they're very dodgy. Lights. You have to hold that button. And it, that, this is a presentation mode now. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. You can go one down more if you want. It's the same, not the work. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I don't really know how I got it to work in the first place. Just turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we had three super moons in a row, and, uh, and they all had these brilliant names. Sturgeon Moon, I'm not sure what the Sturgeon is about. I don't think it was Nicola, but anyway, uh, that, that was a, a very nice picture was Paul got of the moon, moon rising. Um, we didn't have any super moons this month, but we had the harvest moon on the 10th, and uh, that's a picture I took in Bangor over the marina. It's a, it's a very pretty spot during the day, but it was very nice that particular night. And when I went up to the house, uh, there was Jupiter, and I just took that picture out the window. So over the last while, I'm sure you've noticed Jupiter is incredibly bright, and I'm pretty sure Paul will be saying a little bit more about that in a moment. But last month, we had opposition from Saturn, and that was a picture taken by John Hall. It's a beautiful picture, given that he's in the centre, more or less, in the centre or the edge of Belfast, in a highly populated area. It's certainly better than anything I've managed to get so far, so well done, John. And he took that picture about three or four days ago of Jupiter. Again, Jupiter's at its best. Uh, on the 27th, I think, is maybe 26th, uh, Jupiter's at opposition. But you can't miss it, it's there. And of course, we have Mars now coming into the evening sky. You in the east, you can't mistake it. It's glowing red orange, really, really nice. But bizarrely, it's got this phase. And that surprises most people when they first see Mars. It's got a little phase, and you don't think about that. But Mars does indeed display phase. And in John's shot, you can see some. Some nice dark markings. The sun today, um, the sun has been very active and I'm pretty sure Paul will bring us up to date. This was a picture I took earlier um, in Hydrogen Alpha. And the interesting thing is this sunspot over here, it's already been round two weeks ago and it's very active. And it's come back on again. So AR3105, I took that picture through cloud, believe it or not. It's cloudy and banger today. And I took that picture. And that sunspot's come back again and over the last 48 hours, it has doubled in size, so hopefully it's going to be just as active this time because it threw up a few auroras uh, the last time. The sun's been very active over the summer and uh, I've been taking loads of photographs from my house in Alpha. Had this giant prominence, which was pr pretty spectacular, I can tell you. And you can see those dark markings on the sun. Those are actually edge-on views of prominences. So the sun's been spewing stuff all over the place and lots of really good sunspots as well. And of course, sunspots and solar activity gives you aurora and this was a, a fairly disappointing one I have to say I didn't see it but uh, Jonathan up in uh, Bally, Bally Clare John's got a nice dark sky and he saw, saw that one not sure if anybody's seen any aurora recently but that's probably the last one and that was in August an August aurora mm, pretty good you know normally you don't get them unless it's very dark Noctilus and clouds again you know this is our time for Noctilus and clouds over the summer but this year I think it's mostly clouds spoiled it for us, proper clouds, tropospheric clouds, but right on the 11th of August there was a beautiful display. Now normally we don't see them too far in the August if we see them at all, but this was a, quite a nice display. A lot of people said it was the best display for years. I didn't see it, I was sleeping unfortunately, um, but this guy got a very nice picture and sent me it, so yeah, lovely. Percy's. The problem with the Percy's this year was, was full moon and uh, everybody thought that it was going to be a washout, but actually quite a few people managed to not only see Percy's, but to capture them on camera, and uh, very successfully. And you can see here's a couple of nice ones, I think, uh, I'm not sure who got that one. Anybody, anybody recognise the photograph? No? But that was mine, anyway. The best one, yeah. <laughs> that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the other night, uh, of course, who hasn't heard about the firewall? Anybody see it? Me either. <laughs> Despite the fact I was out, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I just couldn't believe it. But apparently it was pretty impressive. 
Now, I, there was a very nice dark wall two nights ago, and another one the night before last. Really, really spectacular. I don't know where they're coming from. There was a huge debate as to whether this was space debris coming back in again, or whether it was a, a, a you know a, a natural event, a meteor or something. We're just not sure. Okay, the big event of the summer from a space flight point of view, of course, was the Artemis launch, which didn't happen. And uh, they were doing some what they called cryogenic demonstration tests today, which, according to Alan earlier, he said they didn't quite go according to plan. That the leaks, <laughs> the leaks didn't uh, didn't seal too well. So uh, I'm not sure whether they're going to go for the 27th or not, or maybe the 2nd of October. But hopefully. The, SDS, the SLS launch will go pretty soon. And it's very exciting, even for somebody like me who, who actually lived through the Apollo. You know, I'm really excited about this and I can't wait to, to things take off properly. I'm not going into the details, but this is unmanned. The only person on board it is, uh, who is it? Paddington Burr or something? No, it's not Paddington. <laughs> There's Sean the Sheep. Sean the Sheep. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, they've, they've got a show that she in there. Okay, well look, that's, that's just a run through of some of the highlights of summer. The next thing we're going to do is hand over to Paul. Let's just hope this IT, where was your HTML? Uh, it's, it's on the um, front right okay. sort of time. Um, I'm just going to go and see if I can make the lights work again. Oh, there, oh, there they are. Oh. <laughs> we had some trouble. No, it's, it's the other... Uh, on the left, right? On the right, right? <coughs> I'll let you do that. <laughs> okay, over to Paul. Paul's going to do the 10 minute talk. Okay, um, everybody see that? Yeah, that's kind of good. Okay, so I'm going to talk uh, just a, a bit about a few things in the sky, and it's already covered some actually, but uh, there's a fair few things going on at the minute. Um, I, I just want to sort of point out to you at this very beginning, um, those of you who sort of take notes with a camera might just want to photograph that. There's various sort of uh, places that we keep our information there. Our website, irishastro.org, and then we've got a Facebook group, which is that, um, and a YouTube channel um, where there's plenty of videos and stuff. Um, and actually those latter two are linked from, um, from the main website. There's, there's buttons at the top that are pretty obvious what they are. Um, but that's just worth knowing there. And there's a couple more of those things coming along that uh, I'll point out when we get there. So, um, well, we've talked a little bit about the sun. Um, and uh, <coughs> this is where we are statistically now. You see, we're, we're down to the point where there's, um, there's been one day so far this year where there's been no sunspots and it was the 8th of June. Um, if you compare that with 11 years ago, you can see we're into the same sort of territory um, that we were then where if this sort of, you get this pattern where you get lots of spotless days. Um, we've had those this time as well. Very deep low in 2019, but coming well out of that now uh, and down to less than 1% of days spotless this year. So it was the 8th of June. And We've got this huge group on the on the faces on here, 3102. Andy talked about this one, 3105, and I don't know quite why they do this. It's a convention, but um, the sunspot formerly known as 3089 is now back and is 3105, and uh, it's already thrown out a few flares, and including a couple while it was on the other side. How do we know? Because we've got satellites on the other side of the, of the sun that can show us pictures of those, but. Uh, uh, of course, we don't get any great benefit out of that, but 3105, well worth a look um, in terms of potential for Aurora. Now, I think I've showed you this before on one of the uh, Zoom chats or whatever. Um, these are the last sunspot cycles. Um, um, so the last one there we had was 24, and 24 was a bit of a minnow by comparison. We still got some pretty good Auroras out of it. Um, 23 before was better, and 22 and 21 before that were, were bigger still. And the projection initially for 25 was it would be much the same as 24, this blue line here. Uh, and that was the prediction made by NOAA and NASA um, around about 2019, they made that prediction. But then another group, Macintosh, said, oh, 2020, and it seems to be backed up by the evidence of what's happening. Um, so that no, actually 2025 is looking a bit bigger. Um, now whether, whether it happens like that, 
that would be optimistic because that would be the biggest one in 40 years. Um, but maybe a bit better than 20, 20, you know, 20 than 24 here. So uh, um, we'll wait and see on that. But it does look it looks quite lively at the minute, actually. So um, we're hopeful there that something will happen. Now things are happening, and uh, this was Norway the other evening. Um, a gentleman called Markus Vanka at uh, of Norway got that. That's where you get right underneath um, the aurora itself, and it's coming at you from all directions. Um, he got a beautiful shot there. Actually, a friend of mine um, uh, I work with, uh, he's been up in Iceland, and he's had some pretty spectacular shots these last uh, last week or so that he's been up there. So uh, it's all happening. Um, there is a coronal hole facing us right at the minute. This this was taken yesterday, and this area here is spewing out solar wind. So it's not not as vigorous as a sunspot explosion, um, but nevertheless can cause some drama. Arrives Saturday, and guess what? The weather forecast for Saturday is not actually bad. So, you know, keep fingers crossed and keep looking out. Um, this is a good time of year for this because there is a thing called the Russell McFerrin effect. And this is really where uh, the magnetic poles line up with the solar wind and make the equinox is particularly good time um, to get aurora. So, of course, and the equinox is. Um, it's Friday, the 23rd, particularly the autumnal equinox. I don't know quite why the big difference, but it does seem to work best for this one. So September, October, really good times for just getting everything right with the Earth's magnetic field and solar winds to, uh, to give us those nice colours. So uh, fingers crossed on all that. Um, to find out all about this, this is another one you might want to take a photo of. Various resources about the aurora. There's a page here that I've built that just pulls together all the data sources like your BZ and your, and your weather and stuff like that. Um, goes right the way down to the oval. Uh, um, and that's on our website, rhastro.org. It's the one on the aurora tab, just there. Um, there's a Facebook group, Aurora UK. That's very, very good um, with live actual sightings. So on spaceweather.com, of course, is the, is, the, uh, uh, is the mecca of all things to do with space weather. It's an NASA site. Um, Aurorawatch.lanx.act.uk um, is a magnetometer, basically, and uh, the data from that does have, have an interesting thing happen there one while, actually, that uh, we suddenly got this massive aurora alert and there. Everything was flashing red and so on. It turned out but actually it was the lawnmower going past the magnetometer. <laughs> 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 and got it uh, spinning away. Uh, and the other one to get an early warning of stuff happening, Shetland webcams, TIFFCAM 3. If you just put Shetland with TIFFCAM 3 into, into Google, that uh, that will show you live pictures probably before anyone else gets to see it. So that really is all I'm going to say about the Aurora. Now, something else you can see in the night sky. Um, that is the International Space Station, um, and that's sort of uh, coming over, coming over my house there, and up through Orion, above Sirius, just missing Procyon up there, um, and that is uh, that's about a four-minute exposure, but it's not one four-minute exposure; it's about um, a couple of thousand of two-second exposures all, all added together, because it's 4K video but that, that's derived from. Um, so I just filmed it going over like that camera in one place. Stars move a bit in that time. That's the Earth's rotation. Uh, this is movement of the spacecraft at 17,500 miles an hour across the sky. And as luck would have it, we are just at the beginning of a whole run of um, passes, including there's one tonight, 21.11. I think we'll probably just miss that one. We'll probably still be uh, being educated here. Um, if it, if that's here by any chance, it's a particularly good one because it's magnitude minus 3.4. 48 degrees up in the sky, which is about as high as it gets from Belfast ever, sort of just over, just over halfway up, um, like that. Um, we, we, we don't, uh, we're not directly under the orbit of the International Space Station here, so it never goes completely above. But if you go to the south of England and further close to the equator, it can be directly above, um, but not here. Um, but there's good, good passes coming up here um, today. There's a good one tomorrow at 2023. Um, an even brighter one at 21.11 on Friday, um, Saturday. And then they sort of all fade out into October there. They're just not quite as bright or as high there. 
and it comes back at the end of October in the morning. So that's International Space Station. Uh, moon phase is always useful to know for a bit of astronomy, and again there's good news here, and that's that we're into waning crescent time here. In fact, I did see about 4 o'clock this morning, I did see a lovely waning crescent moon as I, um, as I got up. I was trying to find where my cat was actually, but, uh, um, but uh, he's in the vets at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, we're coming down to a new moon, and so observing, if there's any observing this weekend, it's a great weekend for it because there's no moon. So uh, we'll have a look at that when we get to it. Now that's good, it's the, that's the Milky Way, the, uh, the September Milky Way, or the end of August, I think, actually. Uh, and that's um, taken from my house in Ballygally. I, I, I moved four miles up the road and it made a heck of a difference to my sky. There's a little bit of light from Larn there, but Ballygally is really rather good. Um, and what I did, I didn't manage to do it with this because some, some work and some don't, but I sort of I took one of the pictures I got there of uh, this is, uh, there's, there's Dena, Vega, Altair, and there's a coat hanger in there, one of my favourite Atlasterisms. Um, and um, and you just send that off to this website, nova.astrometry.net. If anyone's interested, again, take a photograph of that, so you've got it. Um, and they say, and they tell you what you've got. It, it does all the analysis of the star positions and everything, uh, and, and overlays um, all, all your constellations on it, so you, you know what you've actually got. It's uh, amazingly clever. You just put that into a website, it thinks about it for a couple of minutes, and then sends you back that picture, which I think is really, really clever. Now then, just looking southwards, um, I've set this for the 1st of October, half past eight in the evening, so you can do some, some good observing at that time. And that's more or less the view that I showed you before, the Milky Way going down into Scutum, a little bit into Sagittarius. Um, if you happen to be further south, then you can get even a bit further, closer to the core of the galaxy. There, but you've got, uh, you've got uh, Altair, Deneb, Vega, um, quite a few things worth looking at in that area, sort of. Well, Pecula there, you've got um, M27, the dumbbell, you can find that in there. Um, Lyra, you've got the other one, the Ring Nebula, just between those two stars in Lyra. And the North American Nebula, is just up here next to Deneb. Um, better appear on camera, that, because it's very, it's very red, it's uh, hydrogen alpha glow. Oh, is it? Oh, right, yeah. <coughs> yeah, sorry, I forgot, I'm not mic'd up or anything. So, uh, yeah, um, so plenty to see there. Now, planets, um, in the evening we've got Saturn, is beginning to set there, it's down in Capricorn um, and uh, that's, that's coming towards the south at 8.30. Jupiter is a little higher up, neither of these are terribly high up. This is why people, people who've tried imaging these two planets <coughs> in a minute, um, it kind of looks as if it ought to be easy. They're fairly large but you're looking through a lot of air because there's no more than 10 degrees of, uh, of altitude in it. Um, so you're looking for a, a lot of air with some contamination in it, so it uh, doesn't necessarily look that great. But Saturn, um, if you've got a telescope with at least 30 times magnification, you'll see the rings of Saturn, and then you know, you'll be, once you've seen the rings of Saturn, you'll be hooked on the whole thing, because then you've got to buy a bigger telescope to see the rings of Saturn better. Um, and, and stuff like that. And um, <coughs> more easy to see is the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, um, and it's a good opportunity to see that as well. So that's there. Um, you've got other things you can see here. If you look at here, is the great square of Pegasus. And what I do here is I, is I measure in my head the top two stars of the great square of Pegasus, and then I come to this one here, um, Alpharax, and stop, and go the same distance, just slightly off to the right. And I come to a star called Merak, and I stop dead there and do a sharp right turn, and go a short way till I come to a little star there called Mu Andromeda, and go the same distance again. So there's a little fuzzy patch there, which you can just see on this, and that is M31, the great Andromeda galaxy. And that is light from two and a half million years ago. Um, so, no actual proof that it's even still there, but so it probably is, but a bit different and. Uh, uh, and not quite the same place and so on, but it is coming towards us quite quickly as well. But uh, um, if anyone's planning on being here in five billion years, there'll be a collision, which will be a, um, an interesting um, event for all of us. Um, so that's um, things you can see there. I'm going to just go forward um, another eight hours. For those of us who sometimes have to get up really early in the morning, and I'm afraid I'm going back to that before, not very long. 
Um, Jupiter is still there. No, um, Jupiter is still, still in the sky. It's much more over towards the west now, but it's still there. Um, and then we've got all this sort of um, winter constellations coming in here. We've got um, Orion, is the most obvious. You get up early in the morning now, and Orion's right there, right past work at the end this morning. Um, we have the, the belt of three there. Um, Betelgeuse, Rigel. Betelgeuse and Rigel looked to me this morning to be pretty much the same brightness. And two and a bit years ago, that was definitely not the case. Uh, Betelgeuse was much dimmer, lost about one and a half magnitudes. And then I'm still not sure why, I think, I think it's dust clouds or part of the outer shell of the star was ejected, but uh, um, some even thought it might be the precursor to the eventual ending of Betelgeuse as a supernova explosion, but uh, no such luck just yet. Um, but that's, that's Orion. Now, you use the three stars of Orion as pointers, and you can follow them up to Aldebaran. We've got the V shape of the Hyades there. Aldebaran literally means eye of the bull, and that's Taurus the bull there. And you go a little bit further, and there's the seven sisters, and you can play the little game where you count the seven sisters. Um, I only see six. And um, the Japanese, they have a different name for it. They call it Subaru. And if you look at a Subaru car, it has six stars on the front, which I take to mean that Mr. Subaru and me have about similarly not that brilliant eyesight. <laughs> That's my theory. Um, going the other way from Orion down there, Sirius and, um, and, and the rest of Canis Major, one of the few constellations that kind of looks like what it is. Um, you can kind of see a dog with its head here and the hind legs at the bottom there. Things you can't see here, actually, just this part of the sky. Um, when I've been on holiday to, to more sort of tropical places, it's quite interesting that there are stars you can see. That this, this constellation just goes all over the place here called Eridanus the River. Because right down here, somewhere round about there, about 20 degrees um, below our horizon, is a first magnitude star called Apennar, um, and that is Alpha Eridani. Uh, and likewise over here, about 20 degrees below Canis Major, down there somewhere, is Canopus, which is the second brightest star in the sky. And you can, I've seen, I've seen Canopus from Gran Canaria and from Central Florida. I think you have to go a bit further from Apennar because I've only ever seen that from Australia. But uh, so that's that's the. Um, that's the sky, so I'm, I'm going to kind of just touch on one more thing, Andy uh, mentioned this, and uh, uh, I'm so looking forward to this, and the way things were looking until today, that that could, you know, that the next launch window is on my birthday next week, so what, how, how good would that be? <laughs> um, but unfortunately, Andy mentioned this, that uh, there seem to be um, still some problems with the cryogenics, and um, keeping that amount of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen um, in a tank without it leaking is quite difficult. Now the space shuttle did it. Um, the Saturn V did not because they got round it um, by using um, aviation fuel, uh, well, special uh, aviation fuel called RP-1 um, in the first stage. So this really hasn't been done like that before. And this is a slightly <coughs> more powerful rocket than the Saturn V, which hasn't launched since 1973, Skylab 1 being the last. So we're hopeful of this. It's a sort of a this this mission is a sort of a mishmash between Apollo four and Apollo eight. It's not Apollo eight in that no men are involved. Um, Apollo four was the unmanned first Saturn launch, but that didn't go all the way to the moon. What they did with that was they sent it part way out and then actually used the rocket to simulate a moon return um, by speeding it up to twenty five thousand miles an hour, then doing the re-entry. But this this does the whole trip around the moon in a big orbit. That would be one of the furthest out rockets has ever been when it's in that big orb at the other side of the moon. And uh, we'll splash down nearly a month later. Keep the fingers crossed and hope that, that happens um, as it should and very soon. But uh, in the meantime, that's all I have to say. So keep safe and keep looking up. Brilliant, Paul. Absolutely brilliant. Now we have Terry's teaser. Right, Terry. Yep. Somebody said to me, today's the 21st of September. Is it the equinox? Is it the equinox, Terry? It depends. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's already the 21st. It's the 23rd. It's the 23rd. Well done. You don't know what time? 
Nope, not off the top of my head. Three minutes past two. Anyway, what do they need to do? You're not going to just the door. Yeah. Uh, just before the teaser, a couple of things. First of all, we're, we're totally out of, we're discombobulated, as you say, because of the uh, the rearrangement. Derek Hinkley has these books for sale at uh, and other videos at uh, bargain prices. Derek, where are you? Small big tracks for fibers. Right. So. Okay. Secondly, we are locked in, so this lecture had better be good. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> the only way in and out of the building is using a card like this. If anybody needs to leave in an emergency, I take you down, open the door, and let you out again. It also means at the end of the lecture, we'll try and all leave, either in small groups or all at the same time. We can't go out just in dribs and drabs because you literally can't. I don't mind waiting. I know, but lost out anyway. People do leave at different times. People may have buses to catch or trains to catch. Anyway, the point is, if you need to go out uh, before Steph leaves, this card's up here at the front, and I or somebody else will take you down, open the door, and let you out. Well, I would suggest Terry somebody goes down and, and lets people out. Yeah. Just, just well, the, the talk's over, and you can filter out the yeah. suits and okay. borrow and give it back. Yeah. Step, step yeah. I would rather sort of or somebody <laughs> responsible. Yeah. Which I'm here. It's not here. That's not Terry. Vote myself because this is Steph's staff <laughs> card. <laughs> that's lost. She doesn't even get into the building tomorrow. Okay, so that's that. Now the teaser. Teaser always uh, try and relate to the topic of the lecture. So the teaser tonight is what changed in 1979 and 1999. The most Go on. Changing the Neptune. Yes, very good. Well done. In 1979, Pluto came inside the orbit of Neptune. It was still a planet in 1979, so Pluto at that time ceased to be the most distant planet in the solar system and handed over to Neptune for 20 years until it passed out of Neptune's orbit, passed outwards from uh, its perihelion. So yes, February 1979 until February 1999, uh, Neptune was the most distant planet in the solar system. So well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. I'm yeah. just going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because of the horrors of rearranging the venue, and everything, I didn't get time to go and get uh, the usual choices of Mars Bar or a Galaxy, but I will have one for the next meeting. So, but well done. Thank you, Terry. Okay, Thank you very much. Time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, tonight now we, this is the highlight of the evening, obviously, and we're delighted to welcome Stephanie Murrett. Um, Stephanie was actually born of an Irish family in England, and at the age of 17, they moved back to Belfast. You had a good choice, I'm sure. And uh, she then decided to, to do astrophysics. She, she's got the, Stephanie, you've got the, the mic on? I have got the mic on. Is the mic switched on, Paul? Yeah, I think so. It's got, got a green light on it. That's it. I can see. The green light, you can press that. There you are. There is that, none. There's one yet, and you've got um, space in your perfect. Yeah, there we go. And your screen is up there. Let me just double check because this has been. Yeah, sure, it's there. <coughs> yeah, it's there. You, you wouldn't believe the problem we've had with the other lectures, the other ones. We've had all the, <coughs> the top brains, including Professor Fitzsimmons on it, and we couldn't get it to work. Sorry, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie came back to Belfast, did her A levels, and went to Queen's. Did a degree and then did her PhD. And uh, her PhD thesis was on, I have to get this right, I think it was character, characterizing the atomic species present in hot Jupiters. Um, Stephanie now got a, she's now got a job in, in Queens and uh, she's in the department and her research focus has been, um, apparently this is far too small for me, <laughs> I shifted to the study of the outer solar system with the uh, upcoming Verisi Rubin telescope. So Stephanie, thank you very much and very welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to giving this talk. I was supposed to give it in March, got COVID. Really glad to be here today. So I'm going to be talking to you today about the furthest reaches of our solar system beyond Pluto and the enduring myth of Planet X or Planet Nine, the extra planet we just seem to keep wanting to look for beyond our knowledge of what we already know. So I'm going to start with the Planet X theory way back in the late 1800s. And 
the discovery of Pluto in 1930. I'm going to talk about the discovery of the trans-Neptunian objects, so the field of asteroids and comets, uh, which exist way beyond Neptune. Then I'm going to talk about the discovery of the dwarf, uh, the dwarf planet Eris, which led directly to the Pluto controversy and its demotion to a dwarf planet. And then I'm going to talk about the discovery of Sedna, which led to the return of the planet X theory in the form of Planet Nine. I'm going to talk about the evidence for its existence, the ongoing search to find it, and also the controversy which surrounds its potential existence. I'm then going to finish up by talking about my current favourite thing in the world, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which hopefully should be able to settle the Planet 9, Planet X question once and for all, at least until we think of a different Planet X or Planet 9 to focus on. So, Neptune was discovered in 1846, and this was because astronomers had calculated that Uranus was not orbiting the way they expected it to. They believed there had to be another planet out there pulling on Uranus to create its orbit. And they were right, they found Neptune. But then some astronomers did some more calculations, including uh, Babinet in 1848, and they thought, well, actually, Neptune's not big enough to give that much of a pull. We think there must be another planet out beyond Neptune. This was Planet X. And in the grand tradition of very rich people funding astronomical projects just because they have a lot of money, um, the businessman Percival Lowell founded the creation of the Lowell Observatory in 1906, just to search for Planet X. That's him here. Can you see my cursor there? Oh, excellent. Yeah. So there he is. Uh, that's his 24-inch refractor telescope at his observatory. Definitely more useful than firing your car into space, if any billionaires want to take notes. Um, so Lowell believed from the irregularities, the supposed irregularities in Uranus's orbit, that Planet X would have a mass roughly half that of, of Neptune, a low density like the other gas giant planets, and would show a disk or rings. And he thought it would have a diameter of about one arc second, and an apparent magnitude between 12 and 13. So 6.5 is roughly what you can see with the naked eye, and magnitude goes up as things get dimmer. So he thought it would be quite dim, but he thought he'd be able to see it with his telescope. Unfortunately, Lovell died in 1916, apparently heartbroken, before his <coughs> beloved Planet X could be discovered. However, in 1929, the young astronomer Clyde Tomba, who was a former farm boy and only 22 years old, was hired by the observatory <coughs> to continue the search. Now, Tomba used something called a blink comparator. So this takes an image of the night sky at different times and flicks between them. Just flicks between them. And he did this to thousands upon thousands of photographic plates looking for anything that was moving. And after a year of like absolutely painstaking work examining these image pairs, he found it, Pluto, in 1930. And I think, I don't know if you'll be able to see it here, it's very dim. But there's Pluto. And there it is again a few days later. Really terrific work. You wouldn't get even a grad student to do this these days. The thing is, Pluto did not really follow Lowell's predictions for Planet X. It was too dim for a start, only 15 mag, and they didn't see any rings or anything that looked like a ring system. Um, and estimates of its mass were originally made on its presumed effect on the orbits of Neptune and Uranus, so they thought perhaps around Earth mass. But the more they looked at it, the more they had to keep revising that mass lower and lower and lower, especially when we discovered Charon, Pluto's moon. So these are both images of Pluto, and you can see here, there's a little elongated bump. That's Charon, that's the moon. And once you've got something orbiting something else, you can start making some really accurate guesses as to what the mass is. And this is when we started to realize, actually, Pluto is less than 0.25% the mass of Earth. The final nail in the coffin, however, for the Planet X theory was that Voyager 2 flew by Neptune in 1989 and revised its mass. Uranus's orbit wasn't discrepant after all. There were no discrepancies in the orbit of Uranus. There was nothing pulling on it. We didn't need to conjure up another planet to explain its orbit. Planet X theory seemed to be dead. However, we were still very interested in this region of space. You see, for a while now, we haven't known where comets come from. They come into the system, they come out, they must come from somewhere. So Edgeworth in 1943 and Kuiper in 1951 suggested that there had to be a reservoir of comets and larger bodies existing somewhere out there beyond Neptune, around about where Pluto was. 
The second trans-Neptunian object, which was 15760 Albion, wasn't discovered until 1992. Then that was David C. Dewar and Jane Exley after a five-year search. Um, relevantly, the media probably got quite excited and started claiming that it was Planet X. It's not an idea which we seem willing to let die. Uh, but by 1993, we found a handful of other objects out there beyond Neptune. Planet X theory dies again. Now we know there are thousands and thousands of asteroid-like, comet-like objects out there beyond Neptune. These trans-Neptunian objects. There's surveys like um, OSOS, which is the Outer Solar System Survey, Outer Solar System and Origin Survey, and that's, that discovered 800 trans-Neptunian objects alone. So we organise them into a sort of structure. We start here with the Kuiper Belt, which I'm sure Edgeworth would have some problems with, who's alive today. Now this, as you can see, now this is a log scale, so here, 1 AU, distance from the Sun to the Earth is 1 AU, and then that's 10 times the distance, 100 times the distance, 1,000 times the distance. Here by Pluto, you have the Kuiper Belt. So this is objects which are either in a kind of resonance with Neptune, or just kind of sitting there, not doing very much at all. Out then beyond there, we have the scattered disk objects. These overlap with the Kuiper Belt, but their orbits go out to 100 AU. They're kind of unstable orbits. They're constantly being perturbed by Neptune. Quite often one of those will turn into a short period comet and come whirling into the solar system. And then out beyond those, we have the detached objects, or the extreme TNOs, so far out that they're not believed to be gravitationally influenced by the gas giants at all. Now, we'll get back to these later. Out beyond these, we have the Oort cloud, so the flat disk of the Kuiper Belt suddenly starts to become spherical around 5,000 AU. I'm not going to spend much time on the Oort cloud, and that's because we don't have any direct observational evidence that it actually exists. All we know is that long period comets seem to come into the solar system from all directions, and they must come from somewhere. So we've theorized this spherical field of small ice bodies existing 2,000 to 100,000 AU, that's 2,000 to 100,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Billions of objects out there in a very diffuse spherical cloud, but like I said, no observational evidence, we just know comets come from somewhere, probably the Oort cloud. So I'm not going to spend any more time on that. The thing is, even the voyagers are nowhere near the Oort cloud. It will take them 300 years to get there. So if you like, you can wait around that long and see if it really does exist. What I want to talk about now is the discovery of Eris. Eris is a trans neptunian object discovered in 2005 at Palmore Observatory by Mike Brown. Remember that name, it's going to keep coming up. Now, this should play. Yes, it does. Good. There you go. You can see it just moving there. And it has a moon as well. So this is the Palmore Observatory plates. This is a later Hubble image, and you can see Eris here, and it's moon dysnomia. The thing about Eris is, it appeared to be slightly larger than Pluto. <coughs> so of course, NASA and media outlets again started referring to it as the 10th planet. Planet X right again. So Eris orbits at 67 AU, 67 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun. And the thing is, we kept looking, and we kept finding these objects. So this is Pluto, this is the famous New Horizons image, very cool, with its moon Charon. This is Eris, mass uh, radius slightly revised, it's a little bit smaller than Pluto, we think, and its moon. Then you've got Haumea, found in 2004, Marke Marke in 2005, Earth to scale here, moon to scale here. Then you've got <laughs> more and more objects being found, which are of comparable sizes to Pluto, out in this trans neptunian region. Pluto was no longer this lonely planet drifting silently through space on the edges of the solar system. It had friends. It had thousands of friends. Unlike every other planet in the solar system, it was part of a system of suspiciously <coughs> similar looking bodies. And the thing is, we'd actually seen something like this before. This is Ceres. Ceres was discovered in 1801 by Giuseppe Piazza, uh, Piazzi between Mars and Jupiter, and originally when it was discovered, it was classified as a planet. It's round, it looks planetish, but then it was reclassified as an asteroid in the 1950s because we discovered many similar objects in its vicinity. The asteroid belt. 
So the parallels to Pluto are at once pretty obvious. So the arguments whether Pluto should also undergo classification had begun, and they came to a head in 2005 when Eris was discovered. And as we all know, this led in 2006 to the reclassification of Pluto as a dwarf planet, when the International Astronomical Union finally decided we should probably define what a planet actually is. Now, the definition of a planet according to the International Astronomical Union are it must orbit the sun. I have a problem with this already, that excludes exoplanets, so planets, but fine. Second of all is that it must be spherical, it must have become spherical under its own gravity, which Pluto has done. The third definition is that it must have cleared its own orbit, and Pluto exists in quite a busy region of space, it has not cleared its own orbit. This led to the reclassification of Pluto and others like it as dwarf planets. This was controversial. Um, there are still astronomers out there who will argue against it, although most astronomers have accepted it. Mike Brown, the discoverer of Eris, started calling himself the man who killed Pluto, which is a great thing to put on your CV, if you like. So, I also want to make it clear, I had nothing to do with this. I was only 19 in 2006. Please don't send me hate mail. So, not only was Eris not planet X, the 10th planet, we no longer had a ninth planet. Um, did this mean the planet X theory was once again dead? Of course not. This is Sedna. Sedna was discovered in 2003, also by Mike Brown, was also called Planet X by the media for a little while. Sedna is named after the Inuit goddess of the sea, who is thought to live at the bottom of the frigid Arctic Ocean. This is because it is so very distant. It orbits 76 AU at its closest approach to the sun, 937 AU at its most distant, it's 4.3 light days. That's a 12,000 year orbit. Sedna has also been called the most scientifically important trans-Neptunian object, and not just by the guy who discovered it. It's all about Sedna's orbit. Sedna's orbit is really strange. It's really eccentric. And I don't mean that in the sense that astronomers are quite often eccentric. It's elongated. So it comes in close to the sun here, around about 70 AU, and then way out here, around about 930 AU. And then if you look at the side view, it's also inclined. It's kind of going that way. And we don't know why that is. It's too far away to have been perturbed by Neptune, or any of the um, gas giants, and it can't have formed like that, because this is a very brief dive into planetary formation. Planets form from a flat disk of gas and dust, so this is an artist's impression, but these are some actual protoplanetary disks seen by Alma, and as you can see, they're all flat. You can even see the gaps in the rings where planets have been sucking up all the material, which is really cool. And that's why our solar system planets are all orbiting in the same plane and the orbits are all very close to circular. For Sedna to have such a weird orbit, something has perturbed it. Something has pulled Sedna out of that orbit and into its very strange, tilted, elongated orbit. Now there are a lot of theories. Um, the Sun was likely born in an open star cluster, so a more dense region of space where there were other stars around and another star may have been close enough to just tug it out of the way. Um, or perhaps Sedna was captured from a passing system at some point in its history. A nearby star went past and the sun just snapped one of the planets away and that's Sedna. But then we started looking and we found more planets a little bit like Sedna. Six of them were found extremely distant, extremely eccentric orbits. So that should play. Yes, there we go. So you can see here, and it will appear here as well when you, uh, if you want to get an idea of the scale. Yep, six of these orbits. There's Sedna, there's a few more, quite like it. And they're all on one side of the sun. The orbits are aligned, which seems extremely unusual. There's no real reason why that should be. And this is when the Planet X theory rose again. So Constantin Vatigan, and again, Mike Brown, he's back, in 2016, proposed a hypothetical Planet 9 responsible for shepherding these extreme trans-Neptunian objects into these aligned orbits. I can't tell you exactly how its orbital dynamics, they did some very complex simulations, I don't understand them, sorry. But you can see here, they think Planet 9 has an orbit like this, and then all of these orbits come out like this. <coughs> 
So knowing roughly the kind of gravitational pull you need to align these orbits in this kind of orbital clustering, they can make some guesses about what Planet 9 would look like. So these are the most up-to-date guesses, I think, from the 2021 paper. It's theorized to have 6.2 times the mass of Earth and a radius of 2 to 4 times Earth. So you're looking at kind of a mini Neptune. It's a smaller ice giant. So you have the atmosphere of hydrogen and helium, and then ices as you go further in, silicate mantle and iron core. A semi-major axis, or average orbital distance, of 300 to 520 AU. One planet nine year, roughly 10,000 to 20,000 years. So, you might ask, all right, where is it? Where is it in the sky? We can only have a rough guess. This is one guess pulled from Mike Brown's blog. Um, we think it's somewhere near Orion. So you've got Betelgeuse there, there's Orion's belt. Um, this is where Planet Nine would have been in 1000 AD, and 2000, and 3000. It's very distant, it's very slow moving. And unfortunately, its apparent magnitude is probably greater than 22, so it's 600 times fainter than Pluto. So where did it come from, is another question you might ask, because these protoplanetary disks that the planets form from, they don't tend to extend out quite that far. If Planet Nine exists, we don't think it formed out where it, where it lives now. So one of the theories is that when the gas giants were formed, it was kind of a tumultuous period for the solar system. There was a period there where they were ping-ponging back and forth, migrating in and out, doing all kinds of things. It's possible that there was originally an extra gas giant in our solar system, and then while Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune were busy bopping about all over the place, it blew up. Gravitation perturbed right out of the standard orbits of the solar system. Uh, less excitingly, it could have just been, like I said before, an encounter with another star from the star cluster the sun was born in, pulling the distant planet further out, or again, captured from another passing system. We don't have nearly enough information to know. So we've been looking for it. Battingham and Brown have searched archival data, so they've looked through every extant survey we have. Catalina Sky Survey, PanStars, the WISE satellite, the first three years of data from the Zwicky Transient Facility. And they haven't found it yet. But they've ruled out maybe 56% of kind of the parameter space, so potential locations. They're currently using the Subaru telescope, in fact, to observe about 600 to 800 square degrees of space near Orion, roughly where they think it is. But they haven't found it yet. And one of the reasons they may not have found it yet is that the fact that, well, whether Planet Nine is real is very much an open question. If you ask astronomers, you'll find some astronomers are 90% confident, definitely out there. You'll ask another astronomer, 90% confident, doesn't exist, fake news. For a start, there is more than one explanation for why those orbits might have clustered. That passing star we mentioned, or galactic tides, but many of the arguments against Planet Nine's existence hinge on one thing. Is this orbital clustering even a real thing that we're observing? Observational bias. I think everyone is familiar with, simply because whenever you're observing the sky, you're going to be biased in some way. If you observe the sky from Belfast, you're only seeing the Northern Hemisphere sky. Weather, another thing we're familiar with here, can influences what you see. The optics of the telescope you're using influence what you see. Battingham and Brown had gotten their six original objects from a number of different surveys, and they haven't really accounted for any observational bias. It's possible that they found these specific objects in this orbital cluster because they're just the easiest to see. And <coughs> Other large sky surveys like OSSOS or like the Dark Energy Survey have also looked. And the thing about OSSOS and the Dark Energy Survey is they understand their biases very well and they can mathematically account for them. OSSOS especially found eight more of these extreme trans Neptunian objects and they found no evidence for clustering. In fact, you can look at the image here where they've been added. So, I can't quite see. Yeah, this is Planet Nine here. And suddenly you can see we're not really seeing that clustering anymore. That definitely doesn't look as definite as it did before. 
It is still very much an open question. Brown and Gattigan reanalyzed everything in 2021. They included 14 objects, they accounted for observational biases, and they say they're still 99.6% confident that this clustering is a real thing and not the effect of bias. There's also a case to be made that some of the objects they're including are actually still under the gravitational influence of Neptune and therefore should not be included at all. And another case to be made is that this is still very small number of statistics. I mean, 12, 14, 16 objects, it's really not that many. It's definitely not enough to make any kind of solid conclusion on whether this orbital clustering is real or not. So, how do we solve this problem? This is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, currently being built in Chile on Cerro Pachon near Gemini South. It's due to see first light next year, and this is my current favourite thing in the whole world. I work on the LSST. It is a 10-year full sky survey. It's an absolutely unprecedentedly large, deep survey of the sky. Over 10 years, they think they'll be able to drill down to 27th magnitude, which is absolutely wild. It's got four key science areas, so dark energy and dark matter is one, mapping the Milky Way is another, supernovae and other transients, and then, most importantly for this, an inventory of the solar system. So, it's got an eight meter primary mirror, a megapixel camera array over one meter wide, the field of view can fit in seven moons. This is the resolution, so this is a kind of satellite image, and you can see, at this scale, it can image a golf ball, which I think is really cool. It's producing 200,000 images and 1.28 petabytes of data a year, a tremendous amount of data. We won't be looking through this with blink comparators, put it that way. <laughs> and this is what it's set to discover. So, solar system objects here, this is what we already know. Over the 10 years, this is what the LSST will discover. And even if you just focus on trans-Neptunian objects and scattered disk objects, we know about 3,000, 40,000 in 10 years. It's absolutely wild. I mean, 10,000 comets, 280,000 Jupiter Trojans, 6 million main belt asteroids. This is going to be a mapping of the solar system beyond anything we've ever known before. I'm really looking forward to it. Now, as I said, we're not using blink comparators for this. We don't have nearly enough grad students to go through all that data. Basically, we have an automated pipeline. So say you have an object, and in one night, you see it move a little bit, like that. And then night two, maybe you see it move from here, and then here in a second image, and it's here in a third image, and here in a fourth. On night three, you see it here, and then you see it here. These are linked by the automated pipeline to tracklets, into pairs. So the automated pipeline looks at these and goes, I think this is the same object, I think this is the same object, I think this is, and I think this is. And then it looks to see if any of these tracklets can be joined up to form a track. A track consists of at least three tracklets over at least three nights within a two-week period. And once you have this track, you have enough of an orbit to calculate the orbital parameters and declare, we've found something, this is a new object. So, will it find planet 9? <coughs> now, this is a map of the night sky, and this dark grey shaded area here is the area that will be covered by the LSST. The dark grey is the most observed areas, with light grey for lightly observed areas, and here, this is the predicted-ish orbit of Planet 9 with the probability of where it is now kind of getting brighter in this, this area here. And as you can see, basically, Planet 9's predicted orbit mostly covered by the LSST. However, it's possible it's going to be too faint. <coughs> and it's also really hard to get these slow-moving objects. This pipeline I spoke about in the previous slide what you're relying on is that the object will have moved enough in one night to form a tracklet. Planet 9 is so distant that it might not have moved enough in one night for the automated pipeline to pick it up. And this is actually what I'm working on personally as well. I'm currently writing um, an open source pipeline which will be available for public use to all astronomers to take the LSST data and look for the slowest of slow moving objects that might be missed by the automated pipeline. 
A lot of people are probably going to be working on the same thing, including probably Mike Brown. The difference is I'm making mine public because I think we have a better chance of finding it if everybody gets to have a go. But even if we don't find Planet Nine, what we will find are a lot of extreme trans-Neptunian objects. And we will be able to look at their orbits and we will be able to see, is this orbital clustering real or was it observational bias? And I can tell you the observational biases of the LSST are very well understood. This is, again, something I work on, is simulating the observational biases so that we know exactly what we're seeing when we look and we know exactly what we're not seeing. So I think the LSST really is going to be the thing that either puts the Planet X, Planet 9 theory to bed once and for all, or the thing which proves that it truly exists. However, first light for the LSST and the Vera C. Rubin isn't until next year. So in the meantime, um, you guys can get involved if you like looking for Planet Nine. Um, this is Backyard Worlds. Backyard Worlds is using five years of survey data from WISE, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer satellite. This is a citizen science, pro citizen science project looking for volunteers. So. You can look through the images from WISE and you can look for things which move, like this. Or you can look for things which seem to flip, like this dipole, which is the sign of a very slow moving object. It's possible that Planet Nine exists in this data. What's also in this data are probably a lot of brown dwarfs, other interesting objects. The website is there. It's incredibly easy to get involved. You don't need any special training. They'll take you through it. And I love citizen science projects. Um, citizens have gotten themselves on astronomical papers before. Um, I was involved in it with exoplanets, so I'm really grateful to be able to kind of represent it for the outer solar system as well. I'd really recommend everyone gets involved. So these are my conclusions. Um, there's still a lot we don't know about the furthest reaches of our solar system, and the cultural phenomenon of Planet X, Planet Nine, still, even now, even over 100 years later, an open question. The upcoming Legacy Survey of Space and Time on the Vera C. Rubin Telescope will hugely increase our understanding of the outer solar system, perhaps finding or disproving Planet Nine once and for all. And you guys can get involved with the search too with Backyard Worlds. That's the entirety of my talk. I'd be really happy to take any questions. <laughs> That was brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Absolutely mind blowing. Um, just a couple of quick questions for me. First one is: You see this, um, the backyard stuff. Well, what was it? What was used to take to take those images? That was Wise NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. So it's a satellite, and there's five years of data from that. Just waiting for someone to look through it. Okay. And what's the dipole? So, the thing about the images from Wise is that they've removed all the background stars because we don't care about those. We know they exist. One of the artifacts of that is that very slow moving objects, um, they tend to show up after that as these dipoles, just as, a, as an artifact of subtracting the background stars. So anything that moves quite fast shows up as a mover, and anything which moves quite slowly has this strange dipole effect. Mm, looks very like a starship. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, a, another thought there, I, I could be wrong, but I think they took Clint Tom Moore's ashes in the wee craft that went to uh, New Horizons to Pluto. If I didn't know if they did, yeah, that I sounds wonderful. They did. They did. Derek will know. Yes, they did. Uh, Thank you, Derek. Did you put your name on New Horizons? A lot of us did. Any any proper questions? No. Um, thank you, Stephanie. That was a fascinating overview of uh, the outer system. Would you care to hazard a guess? A percentage guess as to the chances of the LSST in the next decade actually finding said planet? What you're really asking me here is do I believe it exists? <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe no. it exists. I would love for it to exist. I'm desperate for it to exist. I think if it existed, one of the other surveys would have spotted it. Hmm. I think if it is there, we'll know from the LSST 100% if it's there okay, in nice. 10 years. Thank you. Was it wasn't Pedro doing some work? Pedro Lacurna? Wasn't he? He was doing yes. Planet X, wasn't he? He, he was indeed, yes. Yeah. He's moved on since, but yeah, same field. Yeah, he couldn't find it either, so. No. Yeah. Oh, we won't find it. Any other questions? <laughs>
Question. Yeah. New Horizons, is it, is it on course for any other, is it charge any other courses, or will that LSSD assist it in any way? That's a pretty good was question. Was the last one, the Snowman? Yeah, I actually don't know if it's swinging past any, that's a really good question, I'll have to look it up. I don't know if I've got much control over it anymore, but fascinating question. I'm not really not sure. I mostly work with ground based uh, programs, so I'm not so good at the space based stuff. Yeah, we just haven't heard of New Horizons in the way, is it? No, that's Probably. very true. Yeah. And it's been taking some cracking images, so yeah. it'd be a shame if that was the end of it, certainly. The problem with New Horizons is the PI of New Horizons, Alan Stern, is. Um, very angry about Pluto being demoted, so it works in a very different field of astronomy than I do. Yeah. I'm, I'm part of the contingent that's okay with Pluto's demotion. Anybody <laughs> <laughs> else? Terry? Um, absolutely fascinating, Steph, thanks very much. Um, one of the slides you showed showed that the extreme TNOs seem to get darker the further out you go. If that applies also to hypothetical planet X, would it be even darker, or would it in fact be sort of, you know, is it merely carbonaceous contract type stuff? Is it going to be more in the infrared and the visible? I know it's only shining by reflected light, but um, the the hypothetical magnitude, I think you said, would be about what 25 or something, it's and LST LSST goes down to 27. Yeah. Is that in, in visible? It should be visible from the LSST, hopefully. It is thought to be an ice giant, so you're looking at kind of the albedo of Neptune ish. Really? Yes, theoretically. It's thought to be big enough to be an ice giant, so we're not looking at something rocky, we're not looking at something extremely dark. Which again is, this is where I think it's. Um, but that assumes it has some atmosphere. sort of an atmosphere that condensed on it. Yeah, yeah. And where do you get the gases out there to, to provide it? This is why I was talking about. Um, where, where did it come from? Uh, because yes, absolutely, right. it can, you're absolutely right, it can yeah. form out there. No way it can form out there, there's not enough material. It must right. have either formed within our solar system and been ejected somehow, yeah. or we've snatched it out from another system. And that, that is the only theory that can account for it being that massive and out there. Yeah, pretty right. much. Yeah, it can well, one of the other ones is it captured from another passing system. Yeah. Yeah, it couldn't have formed out there. We've either it's either been captured from a passing system or it formed in our solar system and was somehow ejected or pulled outwards. Right. Those are the theories. And it's also interesting that it's in the gap between Saturn and Uranus. Uranus is not to work. <laughs> exactly. I mean Uranus being tipped over is another symptom of this very chaotic period of gas planet migration. There was all kinds of stuff happening. Yeah. At that time. I, I have this theory that do you know what if you look at the solar system? It condenses into this disk, but it's got these jets. And in my mind's eye, correct me if I'm wrong, in my mind's eye, I can see the jets coming back down as the earth cloud, very slowly forming this nice sphere around the solar system. I know it's total rubbish, but you know, the, the jets are there. You know, where are they now? Is, is my question. You know, well, I'm assuming they're there. You know. I mean, we think the shape of the Oort cloud is actually due to the fact that it's so far out that the sun's gravitational influence is super weak, and at that point, galactic tides play more of an influence and they're actually strong enough to overcome the sun's pull and just kind of pull it out into the more of a spherical shape than the disc shape of the rest of the solar system. Yeah, that was basically, why is it spherical when everything else is, is, is disc? Exactly, I mean, which is an excellent question, but it is because it's so far away that the sun's gravitational influence is very weak at this point, mm -hmm. so anything can perturb these things into more of an eccentric orbit and over time it's formed a big sphere. Okay, makes sense. Any other questions? Jerry? Uh, yeah, that's fantastic talk. Very good to um, Again, look forward to all the research and development and, and the things that are going to be coming in the next bloody years. Um, just as a bit of background, I was uh, looking into trans Neptunian objects and distances, and I knew it was, it was billions of miles, the sort of distance that we're talking about. And I was actually showing one of the books, it cheered me up today that the distance of Neptune they had printed in the book was uh, 2.8 million miles. <laughs> it's actually 2.8 billion miles. So the distances we're talking are phenomenal. You know, really, really massive distances. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised though, and you mentioned just at the end of your lecture there about um, 
you were detecting brown dwarfs. It's such vast distances out there, and there could be, you know, many um, sort of silver um, sized objects. But is it possible there could actually be a brown dwarf or several brown dwarfs there in the what um, <coughs> kind of up and we haven't detected it? Is that possible? If they're out there, I don't think they are under the sun's gravitational influence. I think we would have noticed them. But Definitely. we will, we could see them kind of in the vicinity beyond the Oort cloud. I think if they were any closer than that, we would start to see their gravitational effects. I mean, they're not large, but they are quite dense. They have enough mass to, to um, create a significant pull. But certainly there's so much out there that we just haven't seen yet. Brown dwarfs are quite dim and they're really, really interesting objects. Like these, I mean, calling them failed stars seems a bit mean. You know, they're not quite planets, they're not quite stars. And we do think there's a lot of them out there that we just haven't spotted yet. Just just out there, kind of in between us and Alpha Centauri kind of distance. So it'd be really cool if Backyard Worlds can find some of those as well, I think. Jupiter almost a brown dwarf, wasn't it? Spurs. Jupiter's not too far off actually. You don't need to go much bigger than Jupiter before you start deuterium fusion and it becomes a brown dwarf instead. Mm. Mm. Any other questions? There's a uh, one of those um, smaller planets like Pluto and Eris. There's one like a, like a rugby ball. Why is that shaped like an egg? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's uh, Halmer, I believe, yeah. That's a really good question, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> it's possible that it's undergone some kind of tidal forces at some point, maybe when it was still warm. I honestly haven't got a clue. It's yeah. weird, isn't it? Yeah, really. <laughs> it's really strange. Yeah, it's spin to such a high velocity. That is a really good point. Could well be spin, yeah. I'm actually not sure. Really good question, though. How's it moving? And it has a moon. Well, it's got a couple of moons, we think. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Lash, go ahead, definitely. Well, on the topic of Pluto, <laughs> I can't help but notice that of the three criteria given for what makes a planet a planet, that Mercury doesn't really fit those criteria, so what's the deal? <laughs> Why is Mercury a planet but Pluto isn't? In what sense? Well, Mercury hasn't really cleared its little orbit, has it? It has more, well. You've kind of hit on another, I have a lot of problems with the IAU's definition of a planet, and this is one of them, in that the definition of what clears its orbit is, is a bit of a strange really one. <laughs> it's really, really vague, and you really have put your finger on another problem I have with it. So, apparently Mercury has, by whatever criteria, sufficiently cleared its orbit, and Pluto hasn't. Now, Mercury certainly doesn't exist in a band of material as dense as the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt. But there aren't any numbers on this. Nobody said, oh, it needs to only have this many objects per square whatever. So while I agree with Pluto's demotion to dwarf planet, and I think dwarf planet is an interesting and useful category, I don't like the IAU's particular definition, and I think that is one of the reasons why, yeah. Just on that. Has Jupiter? <laughs> and you're thinking of the Trojans. Yes, yes. The Trojans apparently don't count because they are only there because of Jupiter. They have been dragged into Jupiter's gravitational influence and they exist because of Jupiter. And apparently that means they don't count. Very convenient. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this is fabulously interesting. It really is. Stephanie's going to be here for a minute or two. Um, okay. I assume we can let people escape. So if anybody's any other questions they don't want to ask now, by all means come. It looks like fabulous stuff's going to happen over the next couple of years, and we'll get you back again, Stephanie, to tell us a little bit more about it, if you're willing. Absolutely. So in the meantime, can I thank Stephanie and usual way? <laughs>